The title of the sermon tonight is The Eternal Nature of Hell. The Eternal Nature of Hell. You want to keep something in 1 Peter 3, but go over to uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And hopefully you can, uh, if, you're, if you're a little tired, if you're a little uh, sleepy out there tonight, you can wake up a little bit and just be ready to turn some to, some, to, to some scriptures. Uh, we're going to turn around quite a bit, but uh, I'll take it easy on it. But uh, the first thing I want to point out is the fact that you know, hell is a real place, and most of Christendom, or what would fall under the umbrella of what is considered Christianity today, would admit that. You know, it's very rare that you'll find somebody who claims the name of Christ that would deny the existence of hell. And the reason why that is, because the, the Bible just talks so much about hell. It says so, there's so many references to hell, there's so much use of hell. I mean, it's just a place that's referred to over and over. There's really nobody that's going to deny that hell is a real place. You know, with the exception of uh, the Jehovah Witness Church. You know, the Jehovah Witness Church believes some very strange things about hell, that it's a place where you just cease to exist, that it's destruction. And one of the things that the Jehovah Witness Church will teach you is that hell, that one of their objections to hell, and they'll say, oh, it's not a real place, is because they say, oh, it goes against the nature of God. It's not in God's nature to torment people in hell for all of eternity. Well, that's just not biblical. You know, that is the nature of God. God is a God of wrath. God is a God of justice and indignation. And he does send people to hell, and they are tortured there forever. And that's why I'm going to get focused more on the fact that hell, not only is it a real place, it is also eternal. There is no escape from it. And you're there. If you went to Deuteronomy chapter 32, look at verse 22. It says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. So not only is hell a real place, but the Bible teaches us that it is, it is kindled by God's anger. The reason why hell exists is so God, or the, the source of hell rather, is, is God's anger, his wrath being poured out. And it says there that it is, it is kindled in his, mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. So, you know, sorry Jehovah Witnesses, but you're wrong, okay? Hell is a real place. And it is a place of torment, and it does not go against the nature of God. In fact, it, it exists because of the very nature of God. The breath of the Lord kindles hell. Go over to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. In Isaiah chapter 30, the Bible says in verse 33, you're going to Revelation 14. For Tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is prepared, he hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. He's saying here that it is the breath of the Lord that like a stream of brimstone. You know, you would think about lava flowing out of uh, a volcano. Like a stream of brimstone doth kindle it. It says that the breath of the Lord is like a stream of brimstone that kindles what? It kindles Tophet. And Tophet is a place that was in the valley of the sons of Hinnom, which is often in scripture a picture of or an allegory of hell okay and again so this is another reference maybe a little bit more obscure but that points us to the fact that not only is hell a real place but that it is God himself who kindles hell that it's not against his nature that it's not like God made a mistake and went oops I didn't mean to make hell he was very intentional in making hell he kindles hell it is his breath that makes it it is his anger that uh, fuels the very fires of hell you're in Revelation chapter 14, look at verse 9. It says, And the third be angel rather, followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So he's talking, of course, in the end days, that those that receive the mark of the, uh, of the beast, either in the right hand or their forehead, that they are going to uh, drink of the, of, the, of the wrath, which is poured out without mixture, meaning it's not diluted. It is the full weight of God's wrath into the cup of his indignation, his anger. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, again, a reference to hell, and that it is done in the presence of his holy angels, and that it is done in the presence of the Lamb. So to sit there and say that, that, that hell goes against the very nature of God is blasphemous. To, to, to accuse God of somehow being wrong to have created a place like hell is wicked. In fact, God says, not only did I create it, that he's actually going to be there. Now, we can't understand with our carnal minds and with our, our limited understanding 
uh, what exactly how that's going to play out, uh, how you could be tormented in the presence of the Lamb, of the angels and the presence of the Lamb in heaven. There's a lot to talk about that there. But the point being is this, is that, you know, hell is real, God made it, and it is eternal. I want to talk to you tonight about the eternal nature of hell. Again, most people are going, even within Christendom, are going to admit that hell exists. Because as we just read a few references, it's, re it, it, it's, it's mentioned so much in Scripture. It's brought up over and over again. Very few people would deny it. But there is, this there is this tendency amongst those that would admit it's real. It'd say, yes, hell is a real place. There's no denying it. Then you get into this other false doctrine where they teach that somehow it can be escaped. That somehow people can go to hell and then get out of it later. And, you know, they, they like to say that because it kind of soothes the conscience, doesn't it? It's kind of a, a reassuring the thought that, hey, maybe somebody went to hell, but you know what? They're going to get out later, and it's not going to be that bad. You know, one of the worst things about hell is that there is no escape. That's probably the most terrifying thing about it, is that once you're there, you're there for all of eternity, okay? And, and that's, it's that way for a reason. Now, some, some people that teach that hell is escapable would be the Mormon church and also the Catholic church. They both teach that hell is not permanent. <laughs> now, notice there in Revelation chapter 14, verse 9, it says in verse 11, and the smoke of their torment, those that have been sent and are being uh, that, are, that are being tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the angels and the presence of the Lamb, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for how long? Forever and ever. Now, if these people somehow could get out later, is that an accurate statement? To say, well, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Look, if they could somehow get out, if there was an escape from hell, that would not be an accurate statement. They would have to read something like, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up, period. Or, ascendeth up for a short time or a long time. It would, it, they could not say that it ascends up forever and ever if hell were not eternal in its nature. It says, They have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So hell tonight is not only real, but it is also eternal in nature. Hell is an everlasting punishment. That's what the Bible teaches us. And if you would, go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3, Keep something again in 1 Peter 3 tonight. We'll be coming back, but go to 2 Peter chapter 3. <coughs> this also is a false doctrine to teach that somehow down the road people are going to escape hell. Hell is eternal. It cannot be escaped. That was the Bible teaches. And we could go to a few references, perhaps, you know, where Jesus taught in Mark 9. He, talking of hell, said, Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. It never goes out. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off, for it is better for thee to halt, enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into the hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. I mean, Jesus is, Jesus is warning, look, the, the, you don't want to go to hell because the fire there is never quenched. It is eternal. It will never end. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 20, the Bible says, hell and destruction are never full. They are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. It says in Isaiah chapter 5, I, uh, therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory and their multitude and their pomp hath rejoiced and shall descend into it. So the Bible says that hell and destruction are never full. And it says that hell has enlarged herself, meaning that hell has made room for more people, right? Now, if people, you now if, if hell is like this turnstile where people are coming and going, does it have to enlarge itself? Is it, would it reach a point where you'd say, oh, now it's full. And now we have to get some people out of here. No, hell is, is it, there is no filling it up. And it has enlarged itself. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. You say, well, that's kind of a reach there. That's a little bit, of, you know, you stretch it a little bit. Well, let's just read 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7. And see how long hell lasts for people that go there. It says in verse 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does it mean to obey the gospel? It means to believe it. It means that people that do not believe the gospel are going to be what? Verse 9, punished with everlasting destruction, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So again, how long is this destruction that they're going to partake in? It's everlasting. If hell is temporary, that is not an accurate statement. You cannot say that they're going to be punished with everlasting destruction, just as much as we would not say, uh, you know, that everlasting life has an end. You know, we say that all the time about soul winning. Hey, how long is everlasting? The last people. You know, I give unto them everlasting life, you know, and they shall never perish. 
He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. How long is it everlasting? Oh, it lasts forever. It never ends. But we can't turn around then and say, well, that, but that's not a proper way to interpret, you know, uh, 2 Th Thessalonians 3. When it says everlasting there, you know, it, it means temporary. No, friend, it's everlasting destruction. Hell, you know, one of the most terrifying things about it is the fact that it never ends for those that go there. Mormons in particular are the ones I want to look at tonight. And, and the Mormon, the Mormon uh, church teach that people in hell will be given a second chance. And, you know, and a lot of times today, uh, when we out door knocking, we'll go into these Mormon neighborhoods. And a lot of times you can tell if somebody's a Mormon without them even saying it, just by some of the things that they'll, they'll say at the door. And, you know, and I was talking to a young lady just recently, and my, my inclination was, I think this lady, this young lady is a Mormon. And sure enough, as I, as I started to pin her down about hell and sin, and she began to say things like, well, yeah, people go there, but they can, get their, they can work out. You know, God, Jesus is going to go there and preach to them and set them free. And even people in hell are going to have a second chance. Now, what does it take to go to heaven? It requires faith, right? You know, that, that we are saved by grace through faith. You know, it's by what we believe. Now, is it, does it take much faith to believe in God when you're in hell? Do you think there's going to be anybody in hell going, I still don't know this is real. I don't know if God exists. No, they're going to know in the instant they, they end up there, everything the Bible said is true. That's going to require zero faith on their part. So how is it that they're then going to be able to go to heaven when it doesn't require any faith at all on their, on their part? It's not going to happen. You know, that's a false doctrine. And the Mormon church is, is in grave error in telling people that those in hell are going to be given a second chance. Now that, of course, we understand that's not the only place where the Mormon church just goes completely off the rails. They don't even have the right gospel. And there, that's a whole other sermon in of itself. But <clears throat> they teach on their own website this is, quote, what they said, quote, Latter-day Revelation speaks of hell in at least two senses. First, it is the temporary abode in the spirit world for those who are disobedient in, mor in, in, morta in mortality. Those that were disobedient in mortality, because, again, they believe in a works-based salvation, they say, are going to go to a place in hell that is going to be a temporary abode. Don't worry, it's only temporary. It only lasts so long. And again, this is something that You'll even notice among uh, Roman Catholics, they'll believe this too. And I worked around Roman Catholics. I haven't studied a lot of their doctrine, but I know enough to know that this is something that they believe, that they'll go to hell and they will pay for their sins in hell. They'll burn off their sins, so to speak, right? And, uh, and they believe that. And you'll leave, I've even known Catholics that'll say, well, I know I'm wicked, living a wicked life, but you know what? I'll just burn it off in hell anyway and go to heaven. And that's kind of, that's a crazy thought to even think. I mean, even if you believe that, you would probably think you would want to minimize your time in hell as much as possible because it's so horrible. But I've even known them, they think, oh, you know, I'm just going to go out and just commit all this sin and just do that. And, and, and then I'll just burn it off in hell and I'll go to heaven and everything will be fine. You know, I know it's wicked, but I'm willing to pay for it. I'm willing to pay the price because they think it's temporary. You know, it's going to be quite a shock when they find out it's not, that they've been lied to. That the, the Catholic Church has been lying to them and telling them, oh, you can just work that off later. <laughs> they'll even say, you know, well, when they get around, uh, remember I worked with one guy. He said, oh, I got, I got to get going on Sunday and, and give confession, so I'm going to live it up on Saturday. He's talking about all the sin he's going to get involved in, and I'll just confess that on Sunday. And, you know, it's, it's, and I'm not doing that to just mock them. I'm not just doing that to, to ridicule people in that. You know, I'm, I'm trying to direct this at the churches themselves. You know, I, I, we should feel pity. We should feel remorse for people who believe that. Because it's going to be a very rude awakening one day when they wake up and realize that they've been lied to, okay? And, and a lot of people, unfortunately, have been duped into these, these false religions and told, hey, yeah, hell's a real place, but it's temporary. It's not that bad. And you'll, you, know, you can get out of it eventually. So it says here you know, that it is a temporary abode for those that were disobedient in mortality. In this sense, hell has an end. That's what the Mormon church is teaching their people today. The spirits there will be taught the gospel, and sometimes following their, following their repentance, they will be resurrected to a degree of glory which they are worthy, of which they are worthy. So you say, well, where are they getting this? And they don't really reference any scripture, but what, from my interaction with, with Mormons, they've always turned to 1 Peter chapter 3, or they haven't turned there, at least they'll know what the 1 Peter 3 says, roughly. And this is what they'll cite to build up this false doctrine. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, it says, For Christ also hath suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, 
that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which were sometime disobedient when, disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water. Now, a lot of people will read that and they'll walk away and say, the Mormon church will say, see, that's Jesus going to hell and preaching to the spirits in prison. Now, does this say anything about hell? It talks about a very specific group of people at a very specific point in time. But they want to read this and say, well, Jesus is going to go preach to the spirits which are in prison and, and bring them back. And, and again, he's going to preach to them and they're going to believe the gospel. Yeah, who wouldn't? Who would not believe the gospel at that point? Zero faith required. It's another thing to get up when we go to a door today and just open up a Bible and say, do you believe the book? Do you? That takes real faith. But when you're in hell and Jesus himself appears to preach the gospel, you know, you're going to believe it. And that won't require any faith. That's not what this passage is teaching at all. Now, I'll try my best to kind of break this down. I know this is kind of confusing. This can kind of throw people for a loop. But here's the thing. There's a very traditional interpretation of this passage, which is correct. Okay, there's a lot of, a lot of other ones that are out there that are incorrect. And, and here's the thing about this. You say, well, you can't just base it on tradition. But you don't want to just write off tradition either. When people have, you know, orthodox views or traditional views like, oh, I don't know, the virgin birth or the trinity, you know, these other things that are just orthodox views that we all share even amongst, you know, you know, you, know, uh, you want to say cross-denominational or something like that. There's some things in the Christian faith that are just everyone kind of believes it that way. And there's a traditional way that this has been interpreted, and I believe it's correct. And, um, and you say, well, you know, they didn't know. We don't want to just write off people from, from back in the day that, you know, read the Bible, studied the Bible, preached the Bible. You know, they knew what they were talking about. It's not like nobody understood Scripture until, you know, we came along or something like that. So he says here in verse 19, well, let's, let's back it up, verse 18. Christ, for Christ hath also once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but, uh, but quickened by the Spirit. So how are we brought to God? We are brought to God by the death of Christ, right? We are, we, he might bring us to God, God, being put to death. He suffered for sins. That's how we are brought to God, okay, through faith. And it says, but quickened by the Spirit. And then verse 19 says, by which. What's the by which referring to there? Remember, this is one sentence. This is not a separate statement. He's saying, by which. Well, he's saying, by the Spirit, right? He was quickened by the Spirit, the Spirit by which. He did what? He went and preached unto the spirits in prison. And people want to read prison as, oh, that's hell. But that's not what it's referring to. It's not referring to hell. <laughs> so the by which is a reference to the spirit, meaning Jesus preached in the spirit to who? The spirits in prison. And again, that does not mean hell. Because, you know, prison, you know, often, you know, you don't really see hell referenced to as a prison. Okay, but we do see sin referenced to as a type of prison or a bondage, right? What does it mean to be in a prison? It means you're bound, right? You're, you're bound in a place. You can't be, you're not set at liberty. You're not free to do whatever you want. You are imprisoned. You are bound. And I'll just read to you a few verses, okay? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, And delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The fear of death is a type of bondage. That is a type of prison. Being fallen in sin, being a, a fallen man, you know, being sinful man that we are, we are bound to hell. We are already in a type of prison. Romans chapter 8, eight verse 21 says, Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. You see how the Bible, it, you know, uses the word bondage to kind of talk about how we are, we are bound by corruption, we're bound by sin. We are already in a type of spiritual prison from, from birth until Jesus, our Redeemer, comes and sets us free from the bonds of sin. It says in Galatians 4, Even so, when we were children, uh, excuse me, when we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. Now, a person goes to prison when they've done what? When they've broken the law, right? 
we have broken God's law, right? And we are therefore sentenced to prison spiritually. We are already bound, okay? So these, these spirits in prison were what? They were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. He's talking about a very specific group of people here. So he's going to preach to the, the spirits which were uh, long suffering and uh, uh, were one, when, excuse me, when once the long suffering God waited in the days of Noah. So let's just take a minute and pretend that the Mormons are right, okay? That, that Jesus went to hell, you know, and preached to the spirits which were disobedient. Are they preaching to all of the spirits in hell, according to this passage? Is that who Jesus preached to by the Spirit? No, he preached once, uh, and he preached to those that were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. So by there, if you want to interpret this passage this way, you have to then admit that what they're saying is, is that Jesus went to hell and preached the Spirit, but only to those that were disobedient in the times of Noah. Sorry, everybody else. Everybody else that died from Noah onward, not for you. This is, oh, you see what I'm saying there? That's what this passage is saying, is that Jesus went and preached to the spirits which were once disobedient in the days of Noah. It's a very specific group of people. So do you think that's what it's saying, is that he went to hell and preached to just the people in hell that died in Noah's day, that died in the flood? Not at all. <clears throat> and we'll get to what he means here in a minute. They, these spirits in prison, they were disobedient in the days of Noah, meaning they disobeyed Noah's preaching. And that's how Jesus preached to them. Now, some people say, well, maybe Jesus went back and it was like an Old Testament appearing of Christ, a like Christophany, where he showed up in the days of Noah and literally preached to those people. Or it could mean what the Bible says in 2 Peter 2, that, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. You know, Noah was a preacher. You know, and he preached for those hundred plus years while the ark was preparing. That's why it says in the long, you know, when once, uh, 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 the, the, when once the long suffering of God waited, and he said, there's going to be a flood, the rain's coming, you need, to, you need to get on the ark. And you know what? That was the long suffering of God. And that was when Jesus preached to these people through a preacher of righteousness named Noah. Okay? <clears throat> That's, I believe, the proper interpretation of this passage. <clears throat> and here's another thing. You say, well, I don't know about the prison thing. But think about it. If you're living in Noah's day, whether you realize it or not, you are in a type of prison in the sense that there's no escaping the flood. They are in a, there's no escape. They are on a planet that is going to be absolutely drowned in water. And everyone that's, anyone that's not on the ark is a goner. So you can kind of see again how that is a reference to a type of prison, isn't it? It doesn't necessarily mean hell. Now, is hell a type of prison? Sure. But that just doesn't line up with Scripture, that Jesus went and only preached to a certain group of people in hell, and somehow they got let free. You know what that is? It's a really nice thought, isn't it? But it's just not scriptural. It's not reality. And as much as that might soothe some people's conscience, you know what? It's not biblical. And our job is always to be biblical and to preach the word for what it says with no apology. <laughs> and here's the thing. This understanding that Jesus preached to the people in Noah's day when, when God was long-suffering, right? That fits with the context of that passage of 1 Peter 3. Because that's what 1 Peter 3 is about. It's about being long-suffering, you know, uh, submitting, you know, to wives submitting their husbands, husbands loving their wives, loving as brethren. You know, it's all about love and patience and understanding and long suffering, right? And he uses Christ as that example of long suffering. Then it would make no sense for him to just say it's all, it's all about long suffering and patience. And oh yeah, by the way, it's this really obscure doctrine where Jesus went and preached spirits in hell for two verses and then just jump back into it. That would be a huge doctrine. I mean, think about it. <laughs> if 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 Jesus went to hell and preached to people there and they're going to get saved and, and were going to be delivered from hell, don't you think there'd be more than two verses in the Bible about it? Don't you think we'd have a little bit more clearer scripture? It's just not what it means at all. It's, 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 a, it's a gross interpretation of it. It's not correct. <clears throat> so this understanding that Jesus was preaching to those in those days, that fits the context. But that's not what the Mormons believe today. They believe that hell has an end in the sense that people are going to be released from hell. And the Bible does not teach that. It goes on on their website and says, those who will not repent but are, are, but are nevertheless the sons of perdition will remain in hell through the millennium. After these thousand years of torment, they will be resurrected to a terrestrial glory. Look, there's not going to be, a, if this were true, there wouldn't be a single person who wouldn't repent. Who in their right mind would not repent? 
you know, those that will not repent. They're saying when Jesus goes and preaches to the spirits in prison, you know, and people are going to get delivered. But those that don't repent, you know, they're going to stay there for another thousand years. Do you think anybody in their right mind would say, no, I'm good? It's ridiculous. If you're, if you're in hell and you've been there for who knows how long, I, if you've been there for a second, and Jesus shows up and preaches to you and say, hey, do you want to believe on me and get out of here? Who wouldn't take that? <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous to think that anybody would stick around. No, I'm good. I'll, I'll hang out in hell. And it says second, so this is their, you know, they're saying, hey, hell, you know, uh, it, it, hell, the latter day revelation speaks of hell in at least two senses. The second sense is it is the permanent location of those that are, who are not redeemed by the atonement of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, there is a grain of truth to that, right? We understand that people go to hell because they have not believed on Christ, because they are sinners, right? In this sense, hell is permanent. It is for those who are found filthy still. This is the place where Satan and his angels and his sons of perdition, who have denied the Son after the Father, has revealed and will dwell eternally. Now, I don't know what they mean when they say that, you know, after the thousand years, those that didn't repent will be resurrected to a celestial glory. I don't know if they mean that then they're going to be judged again. But, you know, hell, hell is, is permanent because, you know, both hell today, which is in the center of the earth, and the lake of fire are both referred to as hell. Okay, they're, they're both hell. When you say hell, you can meet either one of those places. Now, I do believe that there are going to get a very brief, those that are in hell today will get a very brief reprieve from it for just a moment before they're cast in the lake of fire. And that's in Revelation chapter 20, if you want to go there. And look, I know this isn't a pleasant subject. I know this isn't what we always want to hear, but this is the Bible tonight. And we need to, we need to be reminded of these spiritual truths because of the fact that you know, they, they are very sobering. And they should motivate us to want to win souls. And not only that, to be grateful for the fact that we're not going there. That we've been saved. You know, there's nothing special about us, folks. You know, if you're saved, it's because Jesus died for you and that's it. And you put your faith in him. And before that, we were all headed here. You know, and if you're not saved tonight, this is a good reason to get saved. Because hell is real and hell is permanent. And there's no escaping it. And the Bible teaches that people go from hell to the lake of fire which are, again, both referred to as hell. But it says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received the mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So the people, you know, of course, you know, that are dead in Christ, when Christ returns, are going to be uh, resurrected in a moment. A twinkling of an eye, you know, they're going to be with Christ. And then, and then we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But the rest of the dead, those that died without Christ, are going to stay in hell for a thousand years. And then when the thousand years are finished, that's when we're going to have what's called the great white throne judgment. It says this is the first erection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Jump to verse 11. This is in that same time, same time period, at the end of the thousand years. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So this is talking about the people that are then resurrected out of hell. And what are they judged by? They're judged by their works. And isn't it ironic, so many people today, if you talk to them, will say, well, how, how do you know you're going to heaven? By being a good person, by keeping the commandments, by doing what? By doing works. And unfortunately, those are going to be the very things that condemn them. They're going to be judged by their works because, you know, it's, it's, you know there's going to be a, there's a lot of bad things that people do too. We all commit sin. And you can't, you can't balance, it's not like you can tip the scale in your favor or something like that. We all understand that. Verse 13, it says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And here's the thing about that. You know, I, I really want to focus in on those last few verses where it says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. So you're talking about a group of people that have been in hell for a thousand years, 
at least. You know, if they died at the beginning of the millennial reign, if they died at the second coming of Christ, you know they've been there at least a thousand years. But there's people that have been there over 2,000 years. There's been people there that have, that have been there since, you know, the beginning of time that have been there in over 6,000 years. There's been people in hell this entire time in torment. And they've been there for all this time. That's a long time. And they're, then the Bible teaches that they're going to be resurrected at the great white throne. And I've, and I've heard other interpretations, and I'm not, you know, maybe they're right. But some people say that somehow when they're standing before God, that they'll, they'll still be on fire. That they'll still be in that torment. I personally don't believe that. I believe that they're going to have a moment's reprieve to stand before God, to have their senses, to understand what's going on, and then to be judged out of the books that are opened. And to be found guilty. And look, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God in that day. Amen. You know, you can do it now or you can do it then at the great white throne. And, you know, they're going to say the same thing. And they're going to say the same thing that Peter said when Jesus came. I am, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. There won't be any denying the fact that they're a sinner. There won't be any denying the fact that God is righteous. And they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And they'll have to say to themselves and they'll understand on that day that God is right and that they deserve to be where they were. But here's the thing. It says they were cast in the lake of fire. You know, I believe they're going to they're gonna be shown everything. They're going to be found guilty. It's going to be indisputable. They won't have anything to say back. There won't be any pleading. The knee will bow. The tongue will confess. And as much as they're going to want to stay, they're going to be cast into that lake of fire. So yeah, hell might not be eternal in the sense that, you know, the literal, the physical location, the center of the earth, stops for a moment and then is cast into the lake of fire, the outer darkness, but it's still hell. It's still torment. It's still, you know, uh, this terrible place. And they're going to stand there before God and they're going to be cast in the lake of fire. You know why it says cast? Because he's not just going to say, all right, go over there. Okay, then go to the lake of fire now. They're going to have to be drug over there, kicking and screaming and cast in the lake of fire. And that's a, you know, and again, this isn't the pleasant thing that we like to think about. And, and I'm not trying to give people nightmares or anything like that, but this is reality. Amen. This is the Bible that I'm preaching tonight. And you say, well, I don't know if I like that. This is very sobering. Good. It should be. It should sober us up to think about the fact that there are going to be people that stand before God one day, are found guilty after having just spent thousands of years in hell and have a moment's break, be able to just catch their breath for a second and then have themselves judged and then be taken by the angels and cast in a lake of fire once and for all. And here's the thing about that. You know, I believe that we'll be there. We're going to be sleep. We're going to witness this happen. You know, we'll be there in heaven with them. We'll be sitting on those thrones. We'll be part of that assembly. And there'll probably be people that we know. We'll see our loved ones. We'll see our friends. We'll see our coworkers. We'll see people that we knew on earth come and stand before God and be judged and then be cast in a lake of fire. You know, I, I don't know <laughs> how, how I'm going to take that. Right? And, you know, that should motivate us. You know, it'd be a terrible thing if we sat here and, you know, to my shame, I'm sure there's going to be people that I'm going to have to look at and say, man, why didn't I preach him the gospel? Why didn't I preach that guy the gospel? I had a chance. I, I was alone with him in the work vehicle. I, you know, I had a moment where I could have at least asked if he wanted to hear it. But you know what? Out of just shame and embarrassment, I never said anything. I didn't want to be known as one of those Christians. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want any reproach. But now that guy is, you know, going to have to suffer. You know, that's, that's a heavy burden to bear. And that's why the Bible says that God shall wipe away all tears. And it might not just be tears of sorrow. It might be tears of shame and guilt that we feel for our part. The things that we, the, the, when we drop the ball and didn't preach the gospel. We'll say God's the one casting him to hell. Yeah, but God's the one that came and sacrificed his own son. God's the one that came and bled and died and lived a righteous life and did all the hard work. All he wants us to do is just tell them. That's it. Can you at least just do that and tell them so that they, you don't have to see that happen someday to somebody you love? Be cast in the lake of fire. <clears throat> you know, the, pe the permanent nature of hell should compel us to save others. It should compel us. You know, we, it's important that we understand the doctrine tonight. It's important that we know where the Mormons are wrong, where the Catholics are wrong, where the JWs are wrong. Amen. That's good. But you know, more than that, rather than just being biblically sound and having the right doctrine, it, we should do something with it. It should compel us to go out and reach the lost with the gospel. Amen. <clears throat> the Bible says, and if you would, go over to Proverbs 15. It'll be a quick sermon tonight, but 
Go to Proverbs 15. We'll close there. The Bible says in Jude, and if some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. You know, there's some people we should save with fear. You know, that's not what the Mormon church is doing tonight. That's not what the Roman Catholic church is doing tonight. You know, that's not what they're doing when they say, oh, hell's, hell's not permanent. They're taking the fear out of it. They're saying, oh, it's bad. I mean, if you can avoid it, by all means, pray the rosary, you know, keep the sacraments, you know, uh, do whatever the, you know, learn the handshakes or whatever the Mormons do. I don't know, it's, you know, nobody knows because they do it all behind closed doors, whatever weird stuff they get into. Do all their mumbo jumbo. If, you know, if you, can, if you can find time to fit in your busy schedule, you know, at least shorten that time in hell up as much as you can. What are you doing when you do that? When you take the permanent, the eternal nature of hell away from it, you take away the fear. Because look, it's, it's, it's scary, right? It's, it's frightening to think about being in hell, being tormented, you know, in, in a bottomless pit where there's no up or down or left or right with all these other wicked people who are just being punished. I mean, the, you know, it's not just going to be your unsaved neighbor. It's going to be all the reprobates and everybody else that's hated God that through all the thousands of years, you're going to be there. That's going to be your, your company. That's who you're going to be rubbing shoulders with. It's a terrifying thing, but the most terrifying thing of all is the fact that once you're there, you never get out. That's the most terrifying thing. And it's some it would save them with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Well, that sounds scary. It's supposed to be. You know, the, the, the hell should, should scare the sinner to Christ. God made it so terrifying that they would go running and in the other direction. Save me. And that, you know what? Jesus is there with open arms. I'll save you. I've done everything and there needs to be done. And here's the thing, you know, we, we don't like to be reminded of sermons like this, you know, and, and I'll be perfectly honest, I'm not a big fan of preaching it, but it needs to be preached. You know, I went through the sermons, I said, have I preached this down here? You know what, I hadn't. I'm sure I've talked about hell, but I don't think I've ever preached a sermon on hell from this pulpit. And we think, oh, you know, I don't really want to preach that. It's not a very pleasant topic to start out your week. You know, it's not a very pleasant topic for us to dwell on, to think about, but it's one we need to think about. And as much as we might not like it, I want us to consider the fact that God sees it all the time. Look, if it bothers you, don't you think it bothers God? The Bible says that God, he made hell for the devil and his angels. That was the original intent. But when man fell, God being a righteous God has to punish sin, and that's how he punishes sin. You know, and we say, well, that's not fair, but who are we to reply against God? Who are we to say, well, you shouldn't do it that way? Isn't there another way? Can you ma at least make it, you know, can you at least make a way out? Let's just change things in his word and just see, see if we can twist passages like 1 Peter 3 and make it say something that, that's a little bit more soothing to us. But here's the thing. The Bible says that hell is naked before him and destruction hath no covering. You know, we don't often think about hell like we are tonight, probably. We probably don't sit and dwell on the fact that hell is this terrible place and that it never ends and that one day the people that are there are going to be judged by God and then cast in a lake of fire for all eternity. We probably don't dwell on that thought because it's not a very present one. But Bible says that hell is naked before God, that it hath no covering, that God sees hell every single day, and he sees people going into hell every single day. You know, the, Bible, the people is estimated like every four seconds someone dies. Just every four seconds, some other soul is just slipping off and you turning. Every four seconds, just someone dying. How many of those people do you think knew Christ? Just every four seconds, another soul just, and God sees it. We don't think about it very often, but God sees it just over and over again, all day, every day, month after month, week after week, hell hath no covering. And God just sees it as like this just, I mean, imagine what it is to him. Just this flood of souls just pouring off over into eternity, into hell. So before we go, oh, I don't know about that, you know, just consider that God sees it every day. And it's not like God is calloused. It's not like God is cold-hearted. It's not like God doesn't care. God does care. Look at Proverbs chapter 15, verse 11. It says, hell and destruction are before the Lord. Hell and destruction are before him. They're, they're open. They're naked. It has no covering. How much more the hearts of the children of men? How much more the hearts of the children of men? Hell and destruction are before the eyes of the Lord. And he sees everybody dying and going there. How much more the hearts of the children of men. As much as he sees that, he sees the hearts of men. He sees the sons of man and he says, I want to save them. And he did, and, and you know what he did? He sent his son to do that. 
And he's done everything that he needed to do on his part to save everyone. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. He's done everything, and all he's asking us is just go. Just go and tell him. Go, and you know what? Tell him about the permanent nature of hell. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't, you know, don't warn the sinner. Hell is real. It's permanent. Tell, tell the, the, the deceived Mormon at the door, no, that's wrong. That's not what 1 Peter 3 teaches. Here's why. And you believe in a false gospel. And I'm not saying in a haughty way. I'm saying in a humble way. I'm saying in a way that, was, that, that desires to see them as God sees them, as another soul for whom he died. You know, the, the permanent nature of hell should compel the lost to get saved. But how should they hear without a preacher? And how should they preach except they be sent? <clears throat> you know, telling people, just telling, and here's the thing, you know, why, why is this important? Why is it important we understand the eternal nature of hell tonight? Because if you tell people that hell is not, is, 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 is not permanent, they'll take that deal. They'll take it. They'll say, well, then I won't believe on Christ. You know what, if, it, if, it's, if it's not permanent, you know, I'll believe on him when I get there. And I'll just, you know, have my fun, whatever that means, and just live my wicked life and just fulfill the lust of my flesh and, 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 and I'll deal with my sin, you know, and I'll go to hell, and then I'll believe on Christ there, and I'll go to heaven. But if we go around telling people that they can get out of hell later, they're going to take you up on that. But if we go to them and say, look, hell's permanent, that you have this one life to believe on Christ, and that's it, and you could die tomorrow. No one's guaranteed tomorrow. You know, you know not what a day we shall bring forth. If we told people that, you know what we'd be doing? We would be have, that would be the compassionate thing to do. And we would be saving them with fear, pulling them out of the fire, that eternal fire, which is hell. Let's go ahead and pray.